Welcome to this pre-recorded talk on verifying payment channels with TLA+. Traditional blockchains like Bitcoin have the problem that they do not scale very well in the number of transactions performed per second. To approach this scalability problem, off-chain protocols have been proposed that take transactions off the chain and perform them only between a few parties instead of globally using the blockchain. The big research question that we are looking at is how to verify correctness properties and security properties of such off-chain protocols in a way that is accessible to protocol developers. And with the last part, I'm referring to the goal that we do not want to use a complicated proof and we do not want to require protocol developers to understand complicated proofs and write them, um, but instead use a tool to quickly check if a variant of a protocol or a modification of a protocol um, still fulfills certain security properties. And the idea that we had is to specify the protocol and its properties in TLA plus, and then use a model checker to verify the properties. The use case that we are looking at in this talk is a payment channel protocol for which we use the Lightning Networks protocol. The Lightning Network is a payment channel network that has been developed for Bitcoin and it has already been deployed. There are multiple clients and there is an informal specification uh, for the protocol. The goal that we have for this talk is that we want to show that the security property for payment channels is fulfilled for this protocol, or if it is not for an insecure variation of the protocol, we want to output a counterexample so that one can find the flaw in the protocol. And there are multiple challenges for this. First, we need to specify the blockchain, which is the underlying layer for the off-chain protocol. And we need to specify transactions that have signatures and hashes. Then we need to specify time and how the adversary can behave. And the challenge here is that we need to specify this in a way that the state space is still explorable and doesn't explode. And then we want to provide protocol developers with an intuitive and understandable output for counterexamples so that they do not need a lot of time to understand how a protocol um, and an execution led to a counterexample. But first, let me give you an introduction to payment channels. A payment channel is basically a shared account between two parties and both parties keep track on who owns how much in this account. So let's say Alice and Bob open a payment channel by depositing Alice five and Bob two coins into this shared account. Then they create the initial state and both of them store that Alice owns five coins and Bob owns two coins. Now, to make a payment over this channel, Alice and Bob simply update the shared state. So they create a new state, state two, in which Alice owns three coins and Bob owns four coins. So Alice and Bob can make a transaction just by updating the state that is only shared between Alice and Bob. And now Alice and Bob can make multiple transactions back and forth by just generating new states. And once Alice or Bob wants to close the channel, they can publish the latest state on the blockchain and according to this latest state, send in this example, three coins to Alice and four coins to Bob. And now the interesting part here is that 
only to open a payment channel and to close a payment channel, you need interaction with the blockchain. But to perform transactions inside the channel, we have communication only between Alice and Bob. There are two main security properties here. First, we want that each honest party can close the channel in the latest state. So it's always possible for an honest party to close the channel in the correct state. And we want that no party can successfully close the channel in an outdated state. Like here in this example, it would be better for Alice to close the channel in the initial state because she owns five coins here. But of course, it shouldn't be possible for her to do that. Now we look at how the Lightning Network implements this construction for payment channels. The Lightning Network is based on Bitcoin and this uses Bitcoin transactions. And each state is encoded in a commitment transaction, which we can see here. The transaction is signed by Alice and Bob and sends five coins to Alice and two coins to Bob. But it doesn't actually send those coins, it actually makes them redeemable. So five coins redeemable for Alice and two coins redeemable for Bob. And if a new state is created, Alice and Bob simply sign a new commitment transaction that sends, according to the state, three coins to Alice and four to Bob. And now we have the problem that both of these commitment transactions are valid because both of them are signed by Alice and Bob. And when the second state is created, Alice and Bob cannot simply make this first commitment transaction invalid because, because it has already been signed. So to prevent one of the parties to publish this first commitment state, the construction in the Lightning Network looks a bit different than what you see here. The output for one party, in this example, we look at Alice. Um, the output for Alice is not only redeemable for Alice, but also redeemable by Bob if Bob has a revocation secret. And if the second state is created, then Bob receives this revocation secret to revoke the first state. So if we are in state two and Alice publishes the first state, then Bob can use the revocation secret to spend those five coins. And also he can spend these two coins and this Bob gets the whole balance in the channel and uh, thereby punishes Alice for publishing this outdated state. But if Alice would publish the correct commitment transaction of state two, Bob does not have the revocation secret for this state two. And thus only Alice can redeem those three coins. Now there is still a small issue here because we have a race condition. If this initial commitment transaction is published, then Alice can redeem those five coins and Bob can redeem those five coins using the revocation secret. And whoever of them publishes a transaction spending those five coins first wins the race. But of course we want Bob to surely get those five coins if Bob has the revocation secret and to and for this, the output has a time lock for Alice, which means that only 24 hours after this commitment transaction was published, Alice can redeem those five coins. But Bob can redeem them once the transaction is published. So Bob has a time window of 24 hours to redeem those five coins if Bob has the revocation secret. Now, I don't know whether you are still following me or not, 
But even if you're not following me, you will get the point that it is hard to see whether this construction actually fulfills the security guarantees. We have this uh, revocation secrets and we have to understand at what point in time who has which secrets and uh, we have to consider time because of those time locks and it is hard to to find out whether those security guarantees are certainly fulfilled and to show that they are we specify the construction and the protocol that creates and maintains this construction in TLA plus So let's look at the security property that we have specified. You can see it here in an informal way. Uh, it states that in any possible execution, an honest party finally gets at least their correct balance. And this security property must be fulfilled even if the other party publishes an outdated state. In TLA+, this means that formulated for Alice and Bob, that from some point in time on, if Alice has not cheated, then her on-chain balance must be graded or equal to the balance according to the protocol. So this is a high level specification of the security property. And it implies the two properties that I've shown you before. Now, before we can specify the protocol for payment channels, we first need a specification of transactions that are used and the blockchain. And the requirements for this specification are first that we need to specify, of course, all aspects that are required by the payment channel protocol. But then we also need to keep it as simple as possible so that we get, we get a good performance when model checking. And the specification must be instantiable by Bitcoin. So that if we find a counterexample, we can transfer it to the real world and get a counterexample that actually exists in the case of Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. So let's look at how we specified transactions. Bitcoin follows the UTXO model, which stands for unspent transaction outputs. So Bitcoin, the amount of coins that one has is not modeled as an account that stores a balance, but the set of all coins that you can spend. And you can think of a transaction as a transaction that burns some coins and then creates new coins that are unspent unspent transactions. So a transaction has an ID and inputs and a set of outputs. And a set of outputs are newly created coins with a certain value. Transaction has an output ID and an amount, which is the value of the coin that is uh, represented by this output. And it has certain conditions. And to spend an output, to spend such a coin, you need to fulfill one of these conditions. Such so a condition has a type. It can have a time lock, which means that the coin can spend only from a certain time on. And it has certain data, like keys and hashes, that might be required by this condition. Now, to see how an input is specified, we look at a second transaction that spends the first output. So an input here first references a parent transaction that the coin that is being spent is included in. And it references an output that represents the coins that are spent by this input. And, and each input has a witness. The witness has to fulfill one of the conditions specified by the output. And for this, a witness contains signatures or a pre-image for a hash. 
Now, for most of this, it is quite straightforward to model this in TLA plus by using TLA plus records. But the interesting part here is how to specify those signatures and keys and pre-images and hashes. So we take a further look at this. So for signatures, we have the requirements that a signature can only be created using the corresponding key. And we want it easy, we want it to be easy to verify whether a signature and a key correspond. So the approach that we use to specify this is that to sign a transaction with the key K, you simply add the key K to an input's witness. So it's like an, an offline signature, you simply put your name. And here in this specification, you put the whole key. In. And with signatures, we have a, another requirement that we want to be able to send the signature of a transaction to the other party in the protocol. And because this requires a binding of the signature to a transaction, and because we only add the key as a signature, this key is not bound to the transaction, we specify this by always sending a whole transaction that has already been signed. So we cannot send only the signature, but we send the whole transaction. Now, when specifying hash functions, we have the requirements that a hash can be calculated from a pre-image, and it must be verifiable whether a pre-image and a hash value correspond. We modeled this using the identity function. So a hash and a pre-image are always the same if they correspond. And it must be clear from context, which means um, from the variables that a pre-image or a hash is stored in, whether we are looking at a pre-image or a hash. And then we also have the requirement that a pre-image cannot be computed from a hash, or at least it is very difficult to, to find a pre-image for a hash. And to model this, in our specification, we simply never compute a pre-image from a given hash. So even an adversary is not allowed to do this. For specifying transaction IDs, we have the requirement that each transaction has a unique ID. And if a transaction is modified in a certain way, then also the ID of the transaction changes. In Bitcoin, this is implemented by using the hash of a transaction for as an ID. In our specification, we use an arbitrary integer value as an ID for each transaction. And the specification assigns a new ID to a transaction if any part of the transaction is modified. So that each transaction in the specification gets a new unique value. And then we can, having those transactions, we can model the blockchain by the set of all transactions that have been published. Now we can specify the payment channel protocol. And we did this by specifying all possible actions of two users, because we only have a fixed amount of those two users in a protocol. We call them Alice and Bob, and we define their possible actions in a module called a payment channel user. And the specification starts from an initial state in which the ledger contains one transaction with an output that is spendable by Alice. So Alice has a certain balance and she can use this balance to fund a channel and then uh, to make transactions inside this channel. And the next state action um, contains all actions that are possible for Alice and Bob. To give you an overview of the, the actions uh, that we have in the protocol, uh, here is a graph of them. So we have um, 
you probably cannot read them here, but we have uh, different states of the protocol and at the arrows, we have the actions that go from one state to another. So users store the state name of the protocol they're in. They store variables and keep an inventory of all transactions and keys they have. And these actions manipulate these variables and they manipulate the ledger if users publish transactions on the blockchain. And those two users, Alice and Bob, can exchange messages using a global message variable. So it is not possible for Alice and Bob to, to write to the others directly to the others variables, but they can only talk to each other using this message variable. To show you how such an action looks like, we look at one special action that is already the adversarial behavior. Um, the action has a name cheat. So a dishonest user can cheat at any time. And there are different types of cheating. First, there is this typical cheating that I've shown you in the beginning, which means that a user looks into the inventory of transactions that the user has and chooses a transaction that is not the latest commitment transaction and not the funding transaction that was used to fund the channel. And then the user signs this transaction and publishes it on the ledger. So then the user has published an outdated state, which is cheating. But this is not the only uh, adversarial behavior that we want to uh, that we want to use, because we might have flaws in the protocol that give an advantage to a user not just by um, by publishing an outdated transaction, but by publishing any transaction that is valid and sends coins to the user. For example, if um, in this construction that I've shown you, an output is spendable by a user at a time at which the output should not be spendable by the user, but for example, should have been time locked. And to find such flaws in the protocol, we look at um, all transactions that a user can create, and then the user publishes any transaction that is valid. So we call this opportunistic cheating because a user just tries to publish a transaction and sees whether this is possible and the user gains anything from it. And then there is a last type of adversarial behavior that a user can simply crash or just go to the state closed and stop interacting with the other party. We haven't modeled sending of invalid messages because when one user sends a message to the other, um, it is always detectable by the other party whether um, the content uh, that has been received is valid or uh, if it is not detectable, then the adversary doesn't gain anything from it. For example, if the adversary would send a public key that the adversary does not have a private key for, although the adversary should have the private key. So this would not be an interesting cheating. Now let's look at time. We specified a weak fairness property, which means that if a user can perform an action, the user will perform this action. So the protocol doesn't stop if users can still perform actions. And the time, which is specified in the Lightning Network and in Bitcoin, uh, usually as the amount of blocks that have been created in the blockchain, the time progresses at arbitrary times in the protocol. So this models that the protocol between those two off-chain users runs at arbitrary speeds. And, in, and an interesting part here is that we sometimes have a requirement 
that users need to perform an action before a certain time t. For example, if an output is time locked, the other user needs to spend this output before the time lock allows a cheating user to spend the output. And we modeled this in our specification in a way that users specify a limit for time progression, which depends on certain conditions. So if there is a condition that a user needs to become active before time seven, so before time seven, a user is required to perform a certain action. Then the time does not progress further than time seven until either the user has performed the required action or another event happened that caused this action to be not required anymore. And if for some reason this uh, condition fails, then the time can advance further. To limit the number of states that the model checker needs to explore, we modeled time progression, so how time jumps from one time to another, in a way that time jumps only to those times at which a user needs to become active. And because the order that actions can happen in um, can still be in any order, uh, we think that this does not skip any relevant cases uh, for the security property, but we haven't shown that uh, yet uh, with a proof that shows that all executions that are that are skipped are equivalent to an execution that is actually specified by our specification. Now, if we have a counterexample, we want a protocol developer to be able to understand this as easy as possible. And we developed a visualization of the complete state that uh, uh, we have in a protocol. And using this visualization, you can create a, a flipbook style animation, as you see here, to navigate through the states that lead to a counterexample. So in this example, um, you see the inventory transactions of Alice and Bob here and the transactions on the ledger. And this execution that you've seen here is um, for one flawed execution in which uh, Alice can spend an output here that she shouldn't be able to spend. And thus, finally, she gets uh, more coins here on the blockchain than she should be able to get according to the protocol. So this visualization is still a work in progress uh, because um, I'm still working on how to show only the relevant parts uh, for a developer and to make the state as easily understandable as possible. Now let's look at the results of uh, specifying the payment channel protocol. The size of our specification has is about 1,200 lines of code. And to look at the runtime, uh, we chose the uh, following model. In the scenario that we've modeled, Alice starts with 10 coins, and then she pays seven coins to Bob. And then Bob simultaneously pays three and two coins to Alice. And for this scenario, well, the good news is uh, that the security property is actually fulfilled. And uh, we needed to look at uh, a bit more than 1 million distinct states. And the runtime on a notebook, it's about two hours. A lesson that I've learned, an observation that uh, was not obvious to me at, at first, was that the runtime of TLC does not depend only on the number of successor states of one single state, but also on all the branches that TLC explores and that do not lead to a successor state because those branches finally evaluate to false. 
And the more runtime is spent on checking those branches that finally evaluate to false, the longer the whole, uh, the whole run takes. So one challenge when writing the specification is how to write the specification in a way that all branches that finally will evaluate to false evaluate to false as early as possible. So if you have an input or best practices uh, to approach this uh, problem, I'm, I, I would be happy to, to receive feedback on this. Now let's conclude. We have specified a TLA plus specification of transactions and the blockchain that can be used and reused for off-chain protocols. And we have used the specification of transactions and the blockchain to specify a payment channel protocol that uses the same approach as the Lightning Network. And we have implemented a visualization of counter examples, which makes working with this uh, specification a lot easier. We have shown using model checking that the security property is actually fulfilled by this payment channel construction and the protocol. And you can find our specification at GitHub. Well, for future work, uh, we want to look at multi-hop payments, which means uh, we go from one single payment channel to a payment channel network. In a payment channel network, multiple payment channels are interconnected. So a sender can make a transaction over multiple hops, over multiple payment channels to a receiver in the network. And we also want to specify the security properties of these multi-hop payments and to show that they are fulfilled. And we also want to specify another protocol, for example, a watchtower protocol, which includes a third party that watches the blockchain for another party. And we also want to verify security properties for such kinds of protocol. To end, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your comments, your feedback and questions. Thank you. All right, to start, um, how prevalent is TLA plus in the academic Bitcoin community? Are you aware of other success stories? Um, I know of, uh, I think, two um, short stories where people use TLA plus, um, but I guess it's it's not very prevalent. Uh, there is one blog post about um, verifying state channels uh, and uh, one protocol, and that is related to them. And uh, there is one paper about um, uh, verifying smart contracts using TLA plus. Um, but uh, I, I'm not aware of, uh, of other cases. Okay, we have a question here from the audience. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, on the visualization, I was curious, what is the input that you're using for the visualization? Uh, how is it understood? And how is the output generated in what format? Um, I'm, I'm parsing the, the state trace that is output by TLC, uh, so the, the state trace in, in TLA, uh, TLA plus, and um, uh, I'm using a Ruby script that um, uh, parses it to, to an internal representation, uh, and then I'm creating SVGs, uh, so image files, uh, that are then uh, well, added uh, to this to create this animation. Uh, may I follow up on this one? Uh, so there's also Will Schultz's animation module, module um, that he showed two years ago, three years ago. Have you looked into it, or is this something that you developed separately? Um, I, I had a look um, when I studied, but um, well, the most difficult thing of this uh, visualization is um, how to visualize transactions. Um, and uh, that is uh, so, so use case specific that I, I, I had to do this on my own. 
and um, uh, uh, that's why I, I, I use the, the special approach. Okay, makes sense. Because uh, yeah, especially for this, um, these transactions, it's, um, it's important to, to get a visual representation because uh, the textual representation is, is very long. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. I took a crack at trying to analyze a, uh, some cryptocurrency a while back, and I had a big problem with modeling uh, hash functions. Did you ever run into any problem like that? And did you? How did you like overcome it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, what I basically do here is um, that if I use, uh, if I need a hash. I, I simply use the identity function, which means that the hash and the pre-image are the same, which works in this case um, because uh, I can ensure that you always know uh, whether you have the pre-image or the hash, um, but I don't need um, other properties of the function. And for example, for transaction IDs where you use uh, the hash function in, in Bitcoin, um, I use those unique values. Another question online. Um, have you considered the SMT-based Apalachi model checker? Uh, yeah, thanks for the hint. Um, I have considered it, but uh, hadn't had the time to, to check it yet. Um, but I definitely will. Another online question. Um, this one's pretty specific. How do you model the probabilistic finality of Bitcoin? where in practice, the probability of finality is considered large enough after six states? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I basically just abstract away this uh, property uh, by only considering blocks that are considered final, whatever that means. Um, like if you consider six blocks as final, then uh, I only consider blocks uh, in, in this model that are already six blocks deep in the blockchain. And last question, has this protocol been picked up by Bitcoin? Uh, the, the payment channel protocol. Um, uh, oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the solutions that um, uh, give hope uh, to Bitcoin uh, to to be used as as an actual currency and uh, not just uh, to store value because uh, the lightning network uh, makes it possible to actually perform small transactions for only uh, only little fees um, and so um, i think it's uh, yeah it's one of the uh, one of the major developments in, in bitcoin Uh, I have one more question. Um, so you mentioned the problem or, or the optimization with moving expressions further up the top in your, in your conjunct list or disjunct list when you evaluate the uh, spec with TLC. So how did you figure this out? <laughs> That's a good question. It's uh, uh, more uh, try and error. <laughs> um, but well, it's not just like moving uh, expressions in the disjunct list, but um, what uh, was a bigger problem is that uh, sometimes I had big sets that were reduced to smaller sets um, and only only smaller sets that uh, led to, uh, to succeeding states. And um, so the most important step was uh, to, to get those big sets uh, as small as possible. Uh, in few steps. Um, did you use the the profiler that's available in the toolbox to find those bottlenecks, or was it just trial and error, changing the spec, rerunning TLC? Uh, yeah, it was mostly a try and error. Um, I haven't worked with the profiler much yet. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, it's a good hint. Thanks. I'll I'll have a uh, a deeper look into that. Yeah, and then maybe zooming out, last question for me. Um, do you think, what's your engineering judgment in terms of coverage of your specifications? DLC obviously cannot check 
gigantic state spaces, do you think it's good enough to get strong enough confidence for your protocol? Do you think it's necessary to perhaps also look into Apalachi to get stronger, more confidence, or even go down the path of a proof with T-Labs, with a proof system? Uh, yeah, well, uh, that would definitely be, be uh, um, I guess, uh, the, the best goal to reach, uh, to have a proof. Um, I haven't thought enough yet uh, about whether, uh, to, to judge whether I think this is uh, possible, uh, but I I will think of, about this. Um, for like uh, for intuition, I think um, the the current model already captures um, the the protocol good enough so that I'm convinced that it actually is true. Uh, but of course, the proof uh, would be nicer. Okay, do I see more hands? Just circle around once. No. Then I think say we thank our speaker. Thanks, Matthias. Thank you.